Greeting Earthlings, if you follow the channel, you know that we recently paid a visit to Steve Jurvetson to return the Soyuz clock, the Titan missile computer and the Apollo LVDC core memory that he had loaned us for restoration and study. We spent time to explain our findings, but of course we couldn't wait to get a peek at some of the displayed items in his amazing collection and pick up our next restoration project. There are so many exceptional items in this little space that you literally get dizzy the first time around. But it's hard not to notice this full mocker console from the Apollo era, and it has seas of genuine twist light buttons that friend Blanche had first attracted my attention to and that I made a few videos about, which of course allowed me to flex a bit. Have all these little buttons going? Yes, uh, and then I, I have made a little, I, I managed to score a few of those buttons because they were, they were used in military planes, so you can still find them on eBay. Ah, in case they're special. Case they're so, th so they're very special. You can you, you don't need to pull them from the back. You pull them from the front, oh. and then you twist them. They are twist lights. No way! And you pick them out like this. No way! Wow! It's interesting how they did the lettering. Lettering is supposed to be embossed at the back of the button, but they didn't do that. They put an insert. Uh, I suppose they used the H model, which would be the military grade. Then you have to put them back in, and then you push them in, and there you go. That's really cool. They are. So I, I made an entire box out of those. Uh, just Actually, I connected it to uh, to your clock. Ah. Uh, just, just for it. Try it. Yes. And unlike the stuff in the museums, you can actually open it up and study it. And God forbid, make it work again. That's why we need to disassemble more things. So, so you bet, count us in for that one. It even looks like the original electronics were left intact inside. It wasn't very long until we had our arms reaching far into the beast. This console was actually used on the set of Apollo 13, and Ken is already at work studying it. It appears to be a console retool for the shuttle era, controlling communications of some kind. While we are looking at Apollo control consoles, here are some that appear to come from the firing room at the Cape. You can see the nice rototel lights that were a staple of the firing room consoles. Even says rototel light at the back, and these are still fully connected with their beautiful wire harnesses. Look at that. Look at that hand wiring. Beautiful. And what huge rocket does have five giant engines, four of them gimballed. Yes, this is the very panel for the Apollo Saturn V first stage, where you'd nervously watch the steering of the engines during the first minutes of ascent. Incredible. And these giant things are not engines. These are the Apollo fuel cells that generated the power in the spacecraft from liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. That is, unless you have a slight problem in Apollo 13 and they all quit. Do you want to look at it? Yeah. Yeah. Got a problem. Okay. Roger. Stand by, they got a problem. We see a hardware That looks like we've blown the fuel cell three with a KOH in the oxygen side of we believe our telemetry. Flight, I, I've got a feeling we've lost two fuel cells. I hate to put it that way, but uh, I, I don't know why we've lost them. It doesn't all tag up. Uh, flight, we're going to hit 100 PSI in uh, an hour and 54 minutes. That's the end right there. We're proceeding with the shutdown. Special subroutine for fuel cell three. That's affirmative. Mm -hmm. Econ flight. Go ahead, fly. First, Houston. you want to ask yourself if you want to open three. We're going to have, three. have you uh, go through the shutdown procedure in fuel cell one. Open three. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Our O2 uh, no, pressure is like it, yeah. going down, as you note, and the uh, temperature confirms it. Okay, Jack, you are proceeding with the shutdown procedure for fuel cell one. Okay, Jack, understand. Close reactor valve circuit breaker for fuel cell two. Power down converter. Power down battery relay bus. That tie is uh, off. Power down to the 
Of course, as you know, the fuel cells themselves did not fail. As you can obviously tell from this simplified schematic, it makes electricity and drinkable water from oxygen and hydrogen, and the oxygen tank just exploded, depriving them from supply. This fuel cell is actually serial number one used for the development. Wouldn't it be cool if we tried to part back up? I floated the idea to Ben Krasno from the Applied Science channel, and we came back to take a detailed look. So Ben is here because we fancy that we might be able to power up the um, fuel cell in our dreams. <laughs> this is oxygen in, hydrogen and water out, and there is a big nitrogen sphere over here. Oh, here's your other power connector, condenser. Centrifugal separator, pressure transducer, so glycol comes over here. It's a lot of amps and it's the, the thickness of the cable here right. is quite good too. There you go and you have Pretty your 30, 28 volts, whatever, 50 amps, 60 amps coming out of this. Okay, it looks a little bit less intimidating than I've spent some time on it. <laughs> What do you think? Well, I think there's a bit of work left to do. There. Yes, <laughs> this would be a long-term yeah. project, so but that would be exciting. And here is another show-stopping piece, the row of seats from the Apollo command module. What? And I can touch it? Someone pinches me quick to make sure I'm not dreaming. Yeah, the whole thing. yeah I think block one, block two. I bet this one's fun. Cause so it's got the, you know, the as you're moving for docking, I believe. So mm -hmm. Michael Collins would have switched sheets and used this mm -hmm. for docking. But on takeoff, uh, you know, cool hand Neil had this here. And if he does this, punk, abort. Eject. Yeah, exactly. Never used on Apollo with people on board. I, I have to try mm -hmm. to click. And interesting, it goes both ways. I have to see what the other way is. They had all this, this military switches are this feel to it, right? Yeah, satisfactory mm -hmm. feel to it. Locked. The other thing that, that became more apparent only recently mm. to me, kind of seeing the whole couch, is how it all folds up, right? The pivot point, pivot Great. point, Thank you. this can all tuck away, pivot point. So when you're post-launch, you can you tuck, tuck, tuck command couch away. short away and have room for all the other stuff you're doing in the command oh, module. Oh, it pivots here yeah. too. Yeah, I hadn't noticed that until recently. Oh, you pull the pin and, and yep. Got it. So this whole Break thing can tuck kind of away. And, out uh, of and, and this moves also. Oh yeah, this totally moves. This, um, yeah, can, can so you've got um, it. Yeah. So you go so on those are satisfying. Exactly. It's just the mechanicals are so satisfying. Right? You can right. walk into different places right. or put it completely, you know, completely out of the way. Um, and then let's see, get, find a place. The great space. And I love the reminder, squeeze trigger then position, just in case you forgot how it works, right? The like, little reminders. Oh, interesting. I didn't notice this before. There's very different instructions. TV monitor attached. Remind me. Interesting. Oh, and then you can adjust. What's that lever on the oh, headrest? Yeah, yeah. This, this is all you do. Oh, it, it's it's better. It, it, and it's infinitely. That makes sense because people would yeah. have right. positions. Right? Yeah, the helmet. Yeah. Yeah, 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 different heights. Of, it, this is the height range of the astronaut that they would tolerate. <laughs> 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 must, <laughs> must be this high to ride. They, sh yeah. they should have those in cars. So just, mm -hmm. just get the... Exactly. Get your buddy Elon to add that. And like the, the original right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, Must be the short to enjoy. <laughs> yeah. And it keeps coming. Here are sections of the command module control panel. This is the panel for the star alignment optics from the lower bay. Here is a LEM lower left panel signed by astronauts. Beware, if you put the radar in the slew position, you'll get 1202s. After a while, you become a bit jaded. Oh, look, the forward hatch from the Apollo command module. Make sure it's nice and tight before you jettison the LEM. Talking about the LEM, here is a LEM landing leg strut, obviously a test article. It's only when you can get that close to it that you realize how large the LEM actually was. 
is gigantic. Steve handed us some of the smaller limb strut portions. Unlike the electronics that are far, far heavier than you would possibly imagine, these things were feather light. Yeah, yeah. And fly well, but, you know, yeah. I, I have the Lego version. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and unlike other things, these are remarkably light. Uh, let me give you an example. This is what I expected things to weigh. So, like, oh my gosh, like you can hold it with two fingers. Wow, right? Yeah. Like, that's what I say oh, on the wow. computers. Like, why aren't they that light, yeah. right? Okay. It's insane. Wow. It, it, it really is lighter than you think. Here, right. Oh, wow. It, it, <laughs> exactly. It, it, Every one of you said, oh, wow, right? It's it just like, weighs absolutely nothing. It's like weightless. And that in the corner is the coolest exercise bike you'll ever see. This is the bike they used aboard Skylab. And you know, since you have unused Apollo switch gear laying around from your recently cancelled program, you might as well reuse it. So the exercise bike has a LEM inspired control panel. How cool is that? Watch the hydrogen level on the rear wheel buzz while you are pedaling. Every time I show this, I keep talking about Shimano and I need to do my research to know when did Shimano first come up with, you know, and who was the first clipless pedal? I think it was after Skylab actually. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, gosh, how, how could they have recapitulated or reinvented everything, mm -hmm. right? Clips and, yeah. you know, and talk about a beefy assemblage, right? I think you could have gone standard off the shelf bicycle on this <laughs> or some of this, but my favorite is the shoe. So first off, feel how heavy this thing is. Oh, yeah. yeah, so again, weight being a premium. Um, and you look at it, you're like, that's just like the look slash, you know, road bike cleats of today, right? It's got all these big bolts in the bottom. <laughs> but, and so I thought, silly them, what a waste of weight, right? Mm -hmm. Could have used something maybe a little lighter. But, and you might know this, every floor in right, Skylab right, was a triangular mesh where you can lock in at any of 60 degree angles. So this is basically not just for exercise. Mm -hmm. It's for, and I think that's just really cool. And I was ignorant about that. Clock. But enough of that Western stuff, Soviet hardware is well represented too. Here's an entire Soyuz control panel, which I'm told has been flown. You can see the Soyuz clock in its element at the top left. It's the same model of the digital clock that Ken completely reversed engineered and that we brought back to life in a previous episode. And on the right is that incredible globus instrument that is essentially an analog mechanical calculator and that they kept flying until the 80s. I think it is driven in the same way that the analog Soyuz clock is driven, so maybe my driver will be able to make this one work too. Modern space exploration is also part of the collection. Here is a spring from the SpaceX Dragon capsule. Since Steve pays for a large part of the bills at SpaceX, he gets a few choice pieces from them, particularly when things don't quite go as planned and a little consolation prize could help when a large chunk of your investment money just went up in flames. Steve explains how this double titanium spring is located behind the parachute door on the Crew Dragon capsule. To his right is the actual panel from the DM2 Dragon capsule, which got ejected before splashdown. Steve bought it back from a fisherman that recovered it in the Gulf of Mexico. I guess that was the fisherman's best catch of the day. It then got sent back to SpaceX for studying how well it did in re-entry. You can still see two of the big springs at the back. And these are souvenir pieces from Starship SN8, the first high altitude uh, hop test for the Starship that came in a little hot and had a rapid unscheduled disassembly on landing. You can see them pick up the pieces the next day, and voila, here they are. The collection also includes an impressive assortment of relatively large samples of rare meteorites, including this huge piece of the moon. Um, this is Mars. This is a nice, nice sizable piece of Mars, and this is chromite. I need to yeah, touch yeah, it. Yeah, you gotta touch it. Yeah. Touch. <laughs> that uh, ablates. Uh, Slower than the rest of the matrix. Of Mars. Way. Yeah. Earth bodies I've touched. Isn't that amazing. <laughs> and then this is far and away the oldest volcanic rock in our solar system. Some think we'll never find one older. Uh, it's, it was formed before Earth. Uh, and then, but what's amazing about it? It's full of crystals, green, wow. brown, and like. And when I looked with a magnifying lens inside these vesicles, they're crystals all the way down. It's crystals upon crystals. It's mostly quartz and variants, which is very rare. And it was. 
like a magma-like chamber deep in a, something big enough to have a molten core, the mantle, the crust. All right, all right. But we also came here to um, work. Steve asks if we could identify this mystery piece of Apollo Electronics, which took Mike all of about 10 minutes. Mike's ability to recognize obscure Apollo parts and find documentation for it never ceases to amaze us. Right, you, 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 have, <laughs> you have a screw and you give him five minutes in five yeah. among the Should ten. We get the other item and hold it next to it. So you can among see. the ten billion drawings, <laughs> you'll find a drawing that has a screw on it. And I'll tell you the history of the screw's evolution, the engineering level. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Right. Hmm, is there a resemblance? Mm, could be, the label's the same, but do that even these yeah, yeah, those that's things that's are the So for those who are burning to know, this is a piece of signal conditioning equipment that was used in the telemetry system. But eventually, among all the treasures, we were introduced to a pair of rather nondescript boxes. Mm. And then there's a second stage. Okay, what is, this is a transmitter, is this, this is ground or this is a uh, I think it's flight? Man, look, man, the flight. Uh, oh, that must be full of tubes inside. Yeah, it's, supposedly, the guy who sold it to me said it is the most gorgeous of all the artifacts he sold me. That, that has to be the, the traveling wave amplifier. Yes, exactly. It, that, he said that's inside there. Okay. Um, serial number six, you gotta love that. And, uh. That's from the command module? I believe so. Folks, this is the Apollo Command Module main microwave radio link, part of the so-called unified S-band communication system, the incredibly complex radio system that gave ranging, velocity, two-way voice and two-way data, and even television from lunar distances. Alright, bye, see you in the next episode, I sense the beginning of another long Apollo restoration series.